Hello again, fellow audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and today's review is an IEM, and that is the Moondrop Blessing 3, a 320 US dollar two dynamic driver and four balanced armature driver per side in-ear monitor. This was a kind loan from APOS Audio. APOS has asked nothing in return other than a fair and honest evaluation and an affiliate link. So the link that you will see to buy this product from APOS in the description below will be an affiliate link. If you like what I say about it here in this review and you are interested in buying it, please consider using that AP that affiliate link and I will get a few bucks back so that I can continue to bring you content like this because running a channel like this is not cheap. All right, so we will go ahead and do shameless self-promotion and then we'll come back on the other side and talk more about the Blessing 3. Hi, I'm Wave Theory's Human Companion and he wants you to know that your support of this YouTube channel helps keep the reviews coming. If you enjoy Wave Theory's honest, thorough style, then make sure to like this video subscribe to the channel, and check out the links in the description below to sign up for the Patreon or send him a tip through PayPal. All right, enjoy the musings. Most of this review is going to be an overhead view because uh, it's easier with IEMs to do it that way and show you the build and the features and all of that up close just because they're so small. And then I also just chose to go ahead and talk about the sound from that perspective because I was just frankly on a roll, so I uh, ran with it. All right, but uh, a couple of quick things to uh, get out of the way before we get into that. Um, I'll just go ahead and like the, the takeaway for me on this IEM, we'll lead with that and then we'll unpack why I say these things throughout the course of the review, is that this is a, a pretty good product. I think that most, that many, maybe not most, but many people are going to like this quite a bit. I think it's going to be reasonably popular and it's going to sell quite well because it has some very real sonic strengths to it. There are two drawbacks to it that are deal breakers for me personally. One is the physical comfort, and the second is that there is a little bit of unevenness in the frequency response between about 6 kilohertz and 8 or 9 kilohertz that can get a little bit harsh and fatiguing to my ears. But again, it's one of those things where I don't think it's going to bother everyone. And, and there's a flip side of that unevenness that adds a sonic attribute that I think many will like. Okay, so this one lands in the category of not for me, but I get it. I get why many people are going to like it, and it probably is going to be a popular model, falling at a rather attractive price, kind of a budget enthusiast price of $320, let's call it. So um, that's kind of the takeaway, and we'll get into me explaining why uh, of that here in just a bit. So we'll go ahead and we'll cut to the overhead view, and uh, I will show you the build, and we'll talk specs, and then even from that vantage point, I will talk about the sound and the test gear and all of that. So let's get to it. Moondrop Blessing 3 packaging. Okay, got the Moondrop standard waifu girl on there. Never really understood that trend. A little weird and creepy in my opinion, but whatever. That is a cardboard slip sleeve. Pops off there. Actually, let's look at the back of that for a moment because there are some good specs and all of that on here. So we see a frequency response graph, which is targeted at like moon drops in-house targeted there. Just a little bit of a base shelf according to this and follows their target curve pretty close until you get up here into the, uh, you know, six to eight K range right around in there. And then some, some weirdness happens. And that does have some sonic effects, which I will talk about when we get to sound. Otherwise, we see the other important info here, like 14.8 ohm impedance with a 120 decibel per volt sensitivity. So pretty easy driving. And then we have the driver complement, the two dynamic drivers for the base uh, and four balanced armatures for everything else. And the two dynamic drivers are mounted together in what... Uh, Moondrop calls their HODDUS uh, base system. I don't remember what that is, uh, what that stands for, but that is how they do the base in there. And I will kind of show you, you can sort of see this through the IEM here uh, in a moment. I will show you that. 
uh, here in a bit. So anyway, that's the back of the box and some of the important specs. Uh, it uses the two pin cabling system. I will show you the stock cable here in a moment. Anyway, once you get that slip cover off, we get a box that looks like this. Pops open like so, where we see the IEM's carrying case. There's this spot up here at the top of the box. It pulls out where you have the owner's manual and that stuff tucked away in there. Okay, pop these things out of here. These kind of containers here that IEMs often come in can be really hard to get the dumb things out of there. So yeah, I understand they travel well, but they're hard to get out. I guess they only plan on you doing it once. Okay, moon drop carrying case that in here, I went ahead and packed away. They were normally under there, but packed away the stock cable. I'll show you in a moment, airplane adapter, and some of the stock tips, which I really did not use a whole lot. Okay, but anyway, that all fits in there. Packaging is pretty well thought out, actually. Um, pretty solid. Okay. The stock cable, since it's here, I'll show you that. I think this is the same cable that came on the Kato. Reminds me a lot of it anyway, in that it is kind of this silvery color uh, in there. Again, it's the two pin variety. 3.5 millimeter TRS single ended. Um, I, I think it is the same cable that comes with the Kato. All right, um, and it's, which means it's functional, it's fine. I didn't use it a whole lot because I took a look at this and I was like, you know what, I would rather use my own cables that I can put a right angle connector on there for the applications that I use these for the most. And so that's what I did. I use like a, a triple wind cable and uh, that is 4.4 millimeter Pentacon. And when I needed it to, uh, and then used adapters that had right angle connections on them to get to the other kinds of connections that I needed. So anyway, this is functional, it's fine. Um, not a huge problem. I think having a right angle connector on there would have helped its ergonomics just a little bit. Okay, uh, let's see. All right, let's look at the IEMs themselves. See-through, okay, uh, you get this metal plate on the back, which is highly susceptible to fingerprinting and just general grease and dirt. So you might wanna polish up and shine those quite a bit. But then otherwise it is a see-through acrylic, we see the cable input there. You can see the balanced armatures tucked away in there. And then that HOTUS, HOTUS, whatever, however you want to pronounce it. The dual dynamic driver base system, okay, hiding out in there. And then you can kind of see how they use tubes to direct everything down the nozzle and into one's ear. All right. So this leads me to one of my two chief complaints about this thing, and that is the nozzle is again on the thicker side, uh, larger in diameter. And so that for me has some comfort issues because I have narrower than average ear canals. At least I would wager they are narrower than average ear canals. So I always almost, I almost always need the small tips that come with IEMs or aftermarket. I have found that SpinFit CP145s seem to work for me the best most of the time, but they would not stay on these things. Okay, I would stick those in my ear and put CP145s on here and then put these in my ear, pull these out and the IEM, the tip would stay in and this would just come right out. So that wasn't very tenable and I'd have to go through the awkward process of digging that tip st um, stuck down inside my ear. These guys here, I don't think came with the, the, the this Moondrop package. I think these came with a previous Moondrop and these are like the medium size of this like kind of ribbed silicone here. And these fit pretty well. Like the combination of this size and this at least stayed in my ear well. And I like almost again, never go up to the median medium. So even though these are thick nozzle, it might be just that they're a touch shorter than like the variations was. I, I mean, I don't have the variations here to compare. It's a very similar design, all of that. Um, but for whatever reason, the combination of this and this tip at least kept them in my ear. It was still a tight fit. And uh, I couldn't handle it for very long. 
uh, before pain started to set in. And then like it would uh, make the inside or the opening of my ear canal sore. So if I like got an itch or something and went to scratch it later, I'd be like, oh, why is my ear sore? Um, because these things had been in there. So for me, there is deal breaking comfort with this IEM. And, uh, but that may not be true for you, okay? Uh, because again, everyone has a little bit differently shaped ear canal. And I know a lot of people like the moon drop approach. So um, that is a me problem. I don't think that's going to apply to uh, most or even many, uh, honestly, on that. So that's just something to keep in mind here throughout the course of this review. But otherwise we have a nice well-built unit um, here and yeah, solid, built well, and all of that. Should we stay here for sound? Sure, let's stay in this view for sound, why not? So, test gear real quick. Uh, to get acclimated to IEMs, what I typically do is get out my Radzone Ear Studio 100, which is a little uh, OTG Bluetooth mobile DAC amp uh, kind of thing, and then I just connect that to my Samsung Galaxy S21 Plus smartphone, which is doing the filming here, and uh, connect that via Bluetooth LDAC, and uh, just wear it to the gym, like wear it, take these, go do my workouts and all of that, just to get acclimated to the sound using Spotify. Uh, I use Spotify for my OTG when I'm busy uh, doing other things, because the sound quality is good enough for like background music working out, that sort of thing. Okay, that's for the acclimation phase. Then I come back later on and I use my KN N6 Mark II DAP with the EO2 module. Uh, and then I also use my Cord Hugo II, uh, which recently the Cord Hugo II has been fed by its matching Tugo streamer, which I am working on a review for as well. And then on the, the KN and on the Cord, that's where I, I use like lossless or high-res FLAC on local DSD files or a stream lossless FLAC, high-res FLAC from Kobuz. Okay, let me bring back the frequency response curve here for a little bit as we turn towards sound because, I mean, I mean my ears did, I think, hear this uh, fairly well here. You get just a slight bit of a bass shelf here, but it's not super heavy. Like, there's a good amount of sub bass presence and, and rumble here, but it is not overly um, present or overpowering. So it's not a bass head IEM. Like, the, the quantity of bass is not particularly overwhelming. It is, it is there, it is appropriately present. It's not going to scratch the deep itch of a bass head, okay, um, in terms of its presence. Mid-range is fairly smooth and well tonally balanced. Even up through we get some of the ear gain uh, going on here and that matches pretty close. And then you get into like into the treble range. Looks like around, let's see, logarithmic scales can be tough. So here's 2K, 3K, 4K, 5K. So yeah, right here around 6K between like 6 kilohertz and, and 9 kilohertz here, we start to see some raggedness in the, the frequency response. And that uh, has a couple of, of effects. What normally has some fairly strong tonal balance and timbre through the bass and mids gets a little bit out of whack in the treble a little bit. Um, and I, I did not look at this curve. Like I, I know that Moondrop likes to put these curves on their boxes and I like just intentionally didn't look at it until after I listened to these. And then um, in time I was like, you know what? These are pretty good overall, except for you get into the treble range and there's a little bit of shimmer uh, that is a little bit too forward on crash cymbals and they can get harsh and fatiguing. Um, and, and so that kind of messed that up. And then like the, um, some of, of the upper vocal ranges also to a degree could also be a little bit harsh and a little bit forward. And so that was my, my chief complaint about the sound here on these is that the upper registers where there is still a lot of info in the music. We're talking about crash cymbals, the upper uh, ends and upper harmonics of vocals and, and that sort of thing were just a little bit too forward, a little bit too sharp, a little bit too harsh and they would get fatiguing. Um, and it was always a race for my ears depending on what kind of music I was listening to as to whether or not the discomfort from the physical fit 
or the uh, the harshness and fatiguing nature of the treble would get to me first. And it really depended on the kind of music I was listening to. For a lot of hard rock, metal, classic rock, that sort of thing, um, the harshness of the upper of that treble region would get to me first. Uh, but um, if oh, and then if I was listening to like more classical or you know soundtrack kinds of things, then generally the comfort would get to me first. Okay, um, so. That, that's my, my, my most chief complaint here. Now, the flip side of all of that, like if you are not particularly treble sensitive and you can handle that little bit of excess treble energy and peakiness up there, the exchange is that you get a lot of clarity. Like there's a really good sense of separation between different vocal sounds from each other and different instrument sounds from each other and then also vocals and instruments from each other, right? So you get a lot of clarity and a lot of, of separation because of the way that these are tuned. If your ears can handle what mine perceive as the harshness up and through that range. Okay, so uh, that that's the that's the positive trade off there. So it's just kind of like, what are your ears like, and where do your preferences go? Because, and I think I said this at the top of the video, like these are pretty good overall. They're just the two deal breaking parts for me. One is the physical comfort, and the other is that bit of wonkiness and uneven unevenness through the treble that makes them a little bit harsh and fatiguing. But outside of that, <clears throat> these are really strong because the bass is well extended. It's not particularly slammy or dynamic in the low end, but it's very clean and it's got some good texturing and resolution to it. And it's got a, a healthy amount, but not an overbearing amount of bass presence. The mid range uh, is pretty well tonally balanced and smooth, like lower vocal registers sound pretty natural to me through there. And again, well textured, well detailed, that sort of thing. The overall resolution of these like doesn't stand out like it's not forward and it's not aggressive, but there's a fair amount of detail retrieval here and it sounds pretty natural in the way that it is done. And then the sound stage here is pretty big, fairly large and expansive and all of that. And in fact, like the overall sonic presentation really reminds me a lot of the variations, right? Like which is the $520 uh, model in Moondrop's line. Like, Really, this is almost like a, a $200 cheaper uh, variations sibling. Not quite as detailed, not quite as holographic, not quite as overall smooth and refined and defined. But for the $200 price difference, I think it falls right where it needs to in comparison with its uh, more expensive sibling. Okay, right there. So I, that makes me come back to, again, I think a lot of people are going to like this one. I think it is going to sell well. You just have to be aware that there's a little bit of unevenness and forwardness in through the treble range that can be a little bit harsh and fatiguing. And you get this thicker and oddly shaped nozzle that fit different for me than most other IEMs and also was just a little bit uncomfortable for me. Like it, it has some comfort issues. Okay, but then again, I expect to be in the minority on that point. Okay, um, so then other comparisons um, here, uh, other IEMs I've heard in the price range, the, the Mangard TV1 is up there. The, the Mangard TV1 is gonna be more physically comfortable uh, for me. It also has a little bit more sub bass presence and impact, so it's a little bit more of a bass head IEM. It is a little bit smoother through the treble than these are, although I think it might be just a hair more sibilant, but it's in a less fatiguing way for me than these are. But these win on soundstage coherence, like the imaging and the separation and all of that. The mangered T in left center and left right can be just a little bit, like the little bit gap of a gap there, so they're a little bit like three blobby almost, where these are a lot more coherent across the soundstage. 
do new vulcans are about 60 dollars i want to say more expensive than these and the vulcans are probably smoother and more refined than this maybe a little bit more resolving they are also narrower in the sound stage but they are about i would say a little maybe just a hair more holographic within that sound stage in there um the vulcans i think also use the mmcx connectors which um i don't always love i prefer the two pin Okay, on that. And then the Vulcan like fits my ears a little bit better. An IEM that I reviewed recently would be the final A5000, which is about 280 US dollars as a single dynamic driver. And I actually really liked the final A5000. Um, it has a really lush organic timbre to it. It has a thicker, heavier bass than these with more impact and rumble. Um, but these are going to appeal more to the audience that really likes their clarity. Because again, that, that treble peakiness in there does give these a lot of clarity and a really strong sense of separation um, in there. So the A5000 can sound just a little bit thick and chunky in comparison to these, even though I think its overall timbre is a little bit more lush sounding. Those who love a, a clearer sense of detail, I think will prefer these. All right, so uh, yeah, I think that about does it here and we can wrap this up. Um, these are very good. For 320 US dollars, you do get a lot of clarity, get some pretty good detail retrieval, very like pretty large soundstage with good imaging and separation within it, so a fairly holographic presentation. There's a fairly even tuning through the bass and the mids. It does get a little bit okay, uneven there through the treble, which for me, came across as harsh and fatiguing a little bit too often, but I think some will appreciate the trade-off and in, 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 uh, extra clarity and separation that comes with that tuning. And then these are uncomfortable for me, but I expect to be in the minority on that, and I think a lot of people are going to like these and they're going to sell well. All right, so um, we'll go ahead and leave it there. Thanks for watching. I am Wave Theory. This has been my review of the Moondrop Blessing 3. Okay, um, yeah, definitely counting blessings now. Uh, so thanks to APOS for loaning me these. These will be coming back to you soon. Uh, again, to the viewers, if you are interested in this product, uh, please consider using my affiliate link to these in the description down below. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, do all of those things that you do to support YouTube channels, like checking out my Patreon and, Patreon and my PayPal, all of that. Okay, enjoy the music, everyone.